the lecture number three. We're going to talk about getters. Getters are something we mentioned before a little bit. On the first lecture, we uh, spoke about, we, we discussed the algorithms and the, in general object-oriented programming, the problems with object-oriented programming, and we sort of concluded that uh, algorithms are something that make our code less object-oriented than it could be if we would not use algorithm as uh, you know intensively as, as they're coming from procedural programming. On the second lecture we discussed uh, static uh, methods and static attributes and I try to convince you that static things are uh, in general anti-object-oriented uh, paradigm so they are not supposed to be in uh, object-oriented programming because they are Actually, they are uh, global procedures or global functions and global variables, which are, uh, in general, are not, um, in, not composable, not reusable, and difficult to test, and so on and so forth. Now, the getters. Getters are kind of gray area where people uh, believe that actually getters help them write object-oriented programming, uh, object-oriented programs better to make the design more uh, object-oriented, but in my opinion, it's not. And not only in my opinion, I will give you a few quite reputable and quite famous uh, references of the famous authors uh, where they say the same. So I will just summarize what they think and maybe a little bit add my own understanding to this. So getter, this is the structure of the lecture. First of all, I will show you what is a getter. I'm sure most of you understand what it is, but still that will be uh, an important introduction. Then we'll talk about encapsulation. Encapsulation is actually the, the thing which getters are supposed to help us to have, but in my opinion, they don't. Then I will show you some ideas of the alternatives, so how to, to live without getters if it's possible, whether it's possible, and then we will discuss here, we will discuss the uh, one uh, open source library where people use getters and we will take a look at it and uh, criticize the code they write like we did before. Read and watch, there are a number of links, you can find them on the slides, what else to look for, what else to read besides my lecture so that you can trust uh, what I'm saying a bit more. So first, what is a getter? Um, look at the code I show you on two parts of the slide. This is uh, on the left side, it's the, the name of the class is the same. Uh, middle square is the, the primitive, the most primitive algorithm for calculating uh, random numbers. If you don't know about it, uh, look it up. Uh, it's called middle square random numbers. Uh, invented, I don't know, 70 or 80 years ago. Uh, you give this algorithm a seed, so sort of a first number to start from, and then from this seed number, it generates you, every time you ask, the, the algorithm gives you the next number, next number. And these numbers are sort of uh, random, pseudo-random, of course. They're not really random, but they, they look like random numbers every time you do it. So uh, on the left side, we encapsulate, on both sides actually, we encapsulate the seed. So we, we put this uh, seed into the class. So every time we make an object, we uh, provide and the constructor this value and the same here. So the value gets encapsulated. And then we have on the left side, we have a function which, the, which does get next number. And this is the algorithm. So the algorithm calculates the next number. It's not important how it does it. You can, you can like, uh, read about it later, but it, it is named get next number. And uh, uh, the question is about the name get. That's what I'm asking you to look at. On the right side, we have another method, which is called get seed. It's also named get. It's also get something from the class. And the question is, which is a getter and which is not? So can we call uh, what we see on the left side, a getter, and can we call what we see on the right side a getter? A getter, uh, in general, before while you're thinking about the answer, a getter is a method, which is sometimes also called accessor, which was, the idea was introduced, in my opinion, in Java world, but maybe I'm wrong, because maybe I missed the, the, the previous story, but I believe it showed up this idea of getters and setters, setters we will discuss in the next lecture. So getters, they, they were invented in Java world in order to uh, sort of protect 
the, uh, the, the fields of the class. So here, look, this is the field seed. And we don't want anybody to touch that field directly. That's why we put this name, this, this modifier private. And, but we still want to let uh, users, let clients of this class to still read the value of this seed. So that's why we make this private and this one we make, well, we can put it like, we can call it public. Here it's not public, but it's, it's package visible. But it, the point is that it, it is more visible than the encapsulated value. So we make this getter. So nobody can do something like this. So you say new middle square. So this is the class. So you make the, the instance of it. And let's say you call it M. And then you say M dot seed. So let's put it this way. You do number 45. And then you put S equals to M dot seed. So you cannot do this. It's impossible. Technically, you have to do M dot get seed and this is called a getter that's the innovative idea how you enforce uh, the protection of uh, private fields and they call them getters they, they call them get something like seed get seed here we also have the get in front of the in front of the name so the get next number however i'm trying to to show you that this is not a getter this is not a getter and this is Yes, this is a getter. What's the difference? I think it's obvious right now that uh, only the right one is actually a getter because the right one is actually doing what I just explained to you. It just returns what's encapsulated. The method on the left does something different. It, it doesn't return what's encapsulated. It makes some work with the data and then returns the result. So it is not a getter. So for you to avoid the confusion, if you see the name, if you see the prefix get, it doesn't mean it's, it's necessarily a getter. But, the, but in order to avoid the confusion, I suggest you not to use names like this. So this is a wrong name in this case. You should not name your method like this. Name it next number. Or I don't know if you, if you, I don't like it, but still you can use, for example, calculate, calculate number or whatever. But I prefer to give names to methods which return something as nonce, as a, as a, as a, not a verb, not calculate, get, read, build, but make it a name of what it is. So instead of saying calculate number, just call it next number, just a noun. So it has to be a noun next number so that would be a better name but still still people will see it in the end of the lecture that people still confuse even in big libraries they still call something getters with the prefix get while it's not really a getter so it, like the convention right now especially in java world if you use the prefix get then make sure it's really a getter it's something that only provides access to private field in some languages we can even have uh, mechanisms for automatically generating a getter like look at this example my question to you what kind of what is the language do you know what's the language so think for a second and on the left side we have a class document with the constructor this is constructor and the constructor encapsulates the value into the private field into field and then you can get the value of the field using this method name so you can basically do what you see on the bottom. So you make the new document. So you create an instance of this class and then puts means print to the console. So then you see D dot name. Well, you can, you can do this as well. It's a Ruby language. So in Ruby, you don't need to provide the, 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 the brackets. You don't need to say, uh, you don't need to say this, this, if, if there is nothing to, if there are no parameters on the right side, you see the, the instruction, this one, it tells the compiler or interpreter that uh, just generate me this. So I don't have it here, just generate it for me. And as long as you provide this uh, meta compiler instruction or whatever it is, then this method name will just show up and still this is gonna work. I know that the same exists in C Sharp and uh, maybe other languages. So I'm saying this, I'm, I'm, il I'm giving you this illustration to show that the industry, even programming languages, so much love this idea of getters and setters 
that they even make it, they build this stuff into their syntax. I mean, I, I don't like the getters and setters. I believe it's a wrong uh, design idea in general. We should not have getters and setters. But programming languages, some of them, believe the opposite. And I didn't mention it here, but in most IDE, you can find a, a, a function, a button in the IDE, where you create a class and then you can click the button and say, generate me the getters and setters. So you only define the private fields and then generate me getters and setters and they will be just generated in one click. So the IDE, the industry in general, the programming languages, they all love this. But some people, including myself, believe it's a completely wrong idea to have getters and setters. Why? I will explain you a bit later. So why, what, what getters are in general for, except for providing this access? So let's say we're talking about normal getters, not the one I showed you on the first slide, but normal getters, when you have a private field, and then you have a method get, get, get field, get that field, get seed, for example, like in the first, uh, like in the second slide. And what is it for? So why they made it up? I asked this question of ChatGPT because I was, you know, I was searching on the internet trying to find the answer. So apparently there are many answers. So let's take a look at what ChatGPT knows about this. So the answer is number one: encapsulation. It's, it's the biggest, the biggest thing, which which I think is which I disagree about. But they claim it's number one. So getters and setters are fundamental to object-oriented programming principle of encapsulation. So by, by providing this getter, they somehow enforce encapsulation. So it means that they do data hiding. Remember, we discussed data hiding. We want to hide data. So they say, look, we had this seed inside the class as a private field, and we introduce get seed. And this somehow helps us to hide data. I'm not really sure I follow this logic because I still can get the data. So I can understand that you create uh, the private field and then you say, okay, I, this, this field is private, so you cannot access it. But how can you, by providing the getter, enforce, uh, in, enforce data hiding? Let's read on. This is the practice of keeping fields within a class private, then providing access to them via public methods. This means that inner workings of the class can be hidden from outside classes. I cannot understand how it can be hidden if you just provided a getter. So that's my biggest concern and not only mine. So not, that's number one purpose. So they were thinking, the, the inventors of the getters, that they somehow help us to encapsulate the data. Point number two, validations. But this is more about setters. And this is a good point, but we're going to discuss that on, this, on the second lecture. So just skip this for now because this is relevant, so ChatGPT is wrong here, because it, it's, it talks about setters, not getters. Point number three, flexibility and maintenance. Whether, when a field is accessed, accessed directly, you're tied to the field itself. If the field is removed or the type is changed, every access needs to be updated. This is a reasonable, uh, reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable uh, point. So they say, let's say we have this field seed, and I have the method get seed, and then you are the client of my class, so you use my, cla my class, and then you call get seed. And then tomorrow I decide to, instead of having the seed, I decide to, let's say, rename it to my seed. But you're not going to know about this because you're still connected to, to get seed, so you will still continue using get seed, so you don't need to to worry about my renaming from what happened inside. Or let's say I completely get rid of the seed uh, field and I completely restructure the, the, what the internals of my class, but you still don't know about that. You still use a get seed. It makes sense, this kind of flexibility. It makes sense. Of course, it's definitely a benefit because it, uh, it, it decreases uh, coupling, as we discussed before, you know, we don't want two classes to be coupled too much. So we don't want you to know too much about me. If you're the client of me, then you need to know as little as possible. So this is, this is the method get seed for you. And that's it. I'm not going to give you anything else. So what's happening inside of, of my class? None of your concerns. And by using this method, we, by using the, the getter, we somehow enforce that. But if it's a getter, and the getter directly goes to the field, 
then most probably these situations in most cases are not going to happen because they uh, because there is uh, the, the, the user you are getting something from me and then you're using that it means that you are not expecting me to change my structure so if I change the internals in my class then most probably your logic your algorithm will just fail and you will not be able to continue using me just relying on this method get because my internal structure is different so it means that I change the logic I change the uh, I change the idea of what I am my purpose so it, what I've seen so far in my in my experience usually this idea of decoupling the you know, the provider and the, 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 you know, the user is not really as, uh, as effective as it should be in case of getters. But still, it's a valid point. Point number four, control over fields mutability. Making class fields public exposes them to outside modifications. So it's again, again about setters. So this point is again, they're talking about setters. So setters help to enforce immutability. So you cannot change the field. But that's a subject for next lecture. Uh, point number five, ease of debugging. If a field value is correct, incorrect, it's easier to find out where the value was set if it's done through a setter, blah, blah, blah. So again, it's about the setter. It's not for us. Number six, abstraction. Setters, getters, and setters allow the class to change how the data is stored internally without affecting any class that uses it. That's, again, the same which we discussed before. Abstraction or flexibility, the same idea. So good point. We accept it. And finally, enabling Java Beans. I don't know how many of you actually know about Java Beans. I think this idea is officially dead now. So this, uh, this principle of making the design and I think web services, they just killed that idea entirely. So we can, we can forget about this. You can read about Java Beans. I'm not sure they are used anywhere right now. So anyway, you got the idea uh, that in general, people believe that they provide some sort of decoupling and encapsulation, which is a good for, uh, for design. Usually what I know where getters are used very, very, very actively. This is number one uh, place where getters are, uh, ex you know, very active is uh, data transfer objects. So data transfer objects is a pattern. Again, maybe some of you already studied that as design pattern. Uh, it's um, basically an object, which actually, in my opinion, is not really an object, but a container of data. It's, I would call it data container. I would use the word container instead of using the word object. Because by using the word object, we sort of, uh, we sort of compromise uh, the, the idea of all other objects. So look at the example. So let's say we have book data transfer object. Sometimes people use this DTO suffix in order to, uh, that, I mean, maybe now not as much as it was before. So maybe 10 years ago, I've seen many of these DTO, DTO everywhere. Now it's kind of, you know, this trend kind of disappeared, but I'm using it here to show you that, uh, let's say I know what I'm doing and this is my DTO. So that's the book DTO, which contains three private fields, ID, author, and the title. And it has the constructor. In the constructor, I provide these three uh, data primitives, ID, author, and title. They all get encapsulated, and then I can get them. I can get the ID, I can get the author, I can get the title. So this is DTO, How, where it's, where it's used. Let's say we have JSON client. So I'm writing the code, I'm writing an application which connects to some server over JSON, JSON, HTTP, whatever, some, some kind of uh, API. And then I make a call to the external service, maybe a database, maybe a web service. And there is the data coming back to me and I need to return that data to the, to, to, to my, to the code inside my program. So I designed this class, which is called JSON API, and I make a method get by ID. I provide the ID of what I'm looking for, and it returns me the book DTO. So the data that this method found there in the internet, it needs to return to me, and it returns it to me as a, as a, as a container of data where I take this data out 
because I need them. So I need to print this DTO, this DTO sometime, somehow. So I, I, I receive this data container and from data container I take the necessary pieces of data away and use it how I like it. It's extremely popular uh, pattern and uh, it's used more and more and more. And people believe that this is object-oriented programming. So people believe that this is how object-oriented programming is supposed to be. So we use objects as temporary containers for data. That's the main purpose of objects. People believe so. I don't want you to believe that way because it's a, it's a misbelief. It's wrong. They shouldn't be used like this. So this pattern, this entire idea is completely wrong. Why? We will discuss now. But I'm sure you have it in your code. I'm sure you, you've seen that in your code. And now, now you are probably asking yourself, how would I do it otherwise? So let's say I have this JSON API and I need to make a call and I need to return the data and these data need to be used. So how else? So what it should be? Because in, in, in Java, for example, you don't have anything except objects. Well, in the, mo in the recent versions of Java, you have this... Uh, data objects, which are basically data structures or whatever, records, right, records. So Java introduced these records objects, which are similar to this, but they're not called objects, which is, which is, I mean, thanks for that, the Java team, but uh, I think it's, it doesn't solve the, the core problem that we're not writing object-oriented code. So this DTO, data transfer objects, they are data containers, data containers, which also called, I think we discussed it before, we can call it this object is uh, anemic. So it doesn't have any behavior. It doesn't have any, uh, I don't know, meaning of life. It doesn't live, it doesn't behave. It only temporarily stores the data and then the data goes out. So it doesn't add any semantic to the data. It doesn't add any functionality to the data. It's just a container of data. So calling this an object is just uh, pure wrong in terms of object-oriented programming. So maybe it's okay to transfer data container from one place in your application to another place. But this is not object-oriented programming. This is procedural programming. This is what we did in C, for example. In C language, we have a struct. We can say struct. And then in struct, you can define int id. I'm writing C now. Uh, I think it's like this, and then you can say that would be that would be our author, and that would be whatever that would be our title, and that's the end of the struct. So this struct exists in the language which is called C, which has nothing to do with object-oriented programming. It's just a memory structure, which is perfectly fine if we talk about procedural programming. But we move to, to object-oriented programming, and now we start talking about objects. And then we start talking about objects, so we need to somehow step away from this. How? I will show you now in a minute. But, but for now, just understand that if you see this, you are programming in C. You use the syntax of Java, or you use the syntax of Python, you use the syntax of JavaScript or whatever, you use the syntax of a language which is called object-oriented language, but your programming paradigm, your programming thinking is procedural. You're writing code in C. Maybe it's not bad. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying that procedural programming is bad. Actually, I, I gave you the quotes of uh, Linus Torvalds, who is the creator of Linux code, uh, uh, kernel and of git and he writes only procedural programming he doesn't use objects so and and his code is pretty well uh, pretty actively used and one of the best products in the open source world so it's okay but we are in this course we're we're trying to learn object oriented programming and this is different so when you want to use api and get from the api the data and you want to stay in object oriented paradigm then you do it differently, not like you see on the screen. Not like this. You don't let your objects just carry data from function to function. Don't. Objects are not for that because it's kind of, I would say, kind of disrespectful to the object to make it anemic. Objects want to live. They want to have behavior. 
and, be, and this is not behavior. Because some people can tell you, like, look, this is behavior. Like we discussed, you know, this is state of the object, and this is behavior, because there are functions. But it's not really behavior. We cannot call these getters a real behavior, even though they are, they are functions, they are methods. So they actually do something. So if you, if, when you call get ID, then there will be a few uh, bytecode uh, instructions executed there. So you can say it is behavior because the object behaves. Not really. This behavior does not add any value to the data encapsulated in the object. So let me, uh, the, your, the question is being asked right now, is data transfer object, the DTO, is the same in terms of, uh, as, uh, the same as a data container, uh, as string object, for example. Uh, we, can, we can sort of say that way. Yeah, the DTO is sort of maybe close to what, what the string is doing, or the integer and the, with the capital I in Java. So it's just a holder of data. But, but even no, maybe no. Okay, maybe I'm, I'm wrong here. So in the string object, it has enough behavior attached to it. So it's not just the data inside, it's not just the number of bytes, but also a lot of behavior. Here, we have no behavior. It's completely anamic, anamic object, which only is used as a temporary storage of data. So the object doesn't know anything about the data. The object doesn't add anything to this data. This object is completely clueless of how this data being used. It just holds them, transfers, and dies. It's pretty short life of this object and pretty meaningless, which is sad. Okay, and now let's talk about encapsulation. Now I'm getting to the solution of I told you enough about how bad it is, but now you're probably asking, you want to ask like, okay, what's the alternative and uh, what, do you, what do you suggest? And before I give you my suggestions, let's, to, let's discuss what is encapsulation. I'm sure you've heard about this uh, term. Uh, Object-oriented programming is about, uh, usually they say it's about uh, a number of things, but this is inheritance, they say, this is abstraction, they say, this is encapsulation, they say, this is polymorphism, they say. So usually they, they use these four, uh, these four words, sometimes there are many more, sometimes there are more words, but at least these four. And um, I believe they're right. Uh, that this, this is actually the foundation of object-oriented programming, and one of these words is encapsulation. Abstraction we discussed on the first lecture. Remember when we talked that abstraction, the object must be an abstraction of something that's, that's happening somewhere. So if my, uh, my object is called uh, middle square, then it is an abstraction of the algorithm that calculates the random number. So I don't need to know how the algorithm works, I just need to have an abstraction of it. And, and I can use this abstraction, I, I can ask this abstraction to do something for me. I can say, next number, and the abstraction somehow calculates me the next number, and I get it back, and I don't want to know how it's done. That's what abstraction is about, remember that. Encapsulation means, let's read uh, the father of, uh, of Java, one of the fathers of Java and of object-oriented programming, uh, so let's let's read the let's read the quote. It's from the book, very famous book. You definitely need to read this book. Um, encapsulation is most often achieved through information hiding, which is the process of hiding all the secrets underscore is mine of an object that do not contribute to its essential characteristics. Typically, the structure of an object is hidden as well as the implementation of its methods. And then the next quote from another place, encapsulation provides explicit barriers among different abstractions. Here he means objects and modules, whatever, and thus leads to a clear separation of concerns. So encapsulation means, in simple words, information hiding or data hiding or information hiding. So it means that it's very close to abstraction. The idea is close to abstraction, but abstraction is more like... Uh, uh, I, I abstract something away from you, so you don't need to know uh, what it, what's inside, you just need to know what I'm telling you. So you didn't, don't need to know how the algorithm uh, works, you just believe me that I am the algorithm for you. Encapsulation means that you cannot even find out 
Even if you try, you will not be able to find out how the algorithm works. Normally, of course, technically you can find out if you're really interested, but normally a normal programmer will not be able to, uh, to find out what's going on. So information is hidden. So I hide my secrets. And that's the idea of uh, encapsulation. So I encapsulate inside what you don't need to know. And that builds, and that builds explicit barrier among different abstractions. So let's say I am the algorithm which calculates uh, the next random number, and you are a game which decides which, which circle on the screen moves left or right. So you don't know about how I work, and I don't care how you work. Well, you are the, on the higher level of abstraction, so I don't even know that you exist, but you know that I exist. So you talk to me, you ask me, give me the next number. For you, I am just the algorithm, and you cannot see the details of how I work. I hide my information. And that's good. It's very good for design. That's definitely a virtue of, uh, of object-oriented design. If you really can hide this information, why it's good? Because nobody, none of your users, none of the classes and objects that use you will be able to... Uh, to abuse you, uh, will be able to use you in a wrong way because they know only what you give them, what you let them know. So they will have very limited and very controlled way of using you. And that creates, uh, that creates, uh, that decreases the coupling. Again, this coupling, remember, we have these uh, two things. We have coupling I told you about them, coupling and cohesion. So coupling incre uh, decreases, and this is good. So we need to go down here and we need to go up here. So uh, coupling decreases when you don't know about me. You just use me, but you don't know how I work and you cannot know. It's good because you will not be able to, it, because it, we will be able to um, I will be able to change my implementation easily without worrying about who will fail after my changes. So I can freely modify my internals without even letting you know. Let's say now my algorithm is ran the, the random algorithm for generating numbers is the middle square algorithm. Tomorrow I decide to implement something more powerful. I don't need even to tell you about this. If you don't know what's inside of me, if you even don't know that I have a seed number. So I didn't provide you the get seed function, get seed method. I only provide you the, the method which is called next number. So take the next number, how I get this number, where do I get it, how I calculate it, none of your concern. It's good for me, good for you, because you don't worry about my changes inside and I can do changes freely. I can do changes more uh, in a more relaxed mode and that encourages faster modifications of the code, less bugs in the end, uh, less, uh, less troubles on the releases, on the, on the massive changes of the code. There are many, many, many things which, which come from loose coupling. So loose coupling is absolutely a fundamental uh, positive ingredient of software engineering. And encapsulation leads to loose coupling. So case closed, it seems. Encapsulation is good, hide the information, provide the getters, <laughs> which somehow will protect your uh, private uh, fields. I don't know how, but it will. Uh, and, uh, and then that's it. It's not it, because some people argue about this. Let's read another quote. Uh, David West, I told you about him. This is the book which you absolutely must read if you want to... Uh, to know more about object-oriented programming. If you want to understand object-oriented programming, how I teach you. So if you want the classic object-oriented programming, the traditional, the mainstream, then this is the book for you. So read this book, you will get this, you will learn the traditional, uh, the mainstream object-oriented programming. If you want to learn the, uh, a better, in my opinion, a better object-oriented programming, then this is the book for you, object thinking. So David West is saying, in most ways, encapsulation is a discipline more than a real barrier. Seldom, means rarely, 
the integrity of an object is protected in any absolute sense. And this is especially true on soft software projects, so it's up to the user of an object to respect the object's encapsulation. So the point here is that technically, using the language instruments, you cannot really protect the information. And here, definitely, he means, maybe not directly, but he's definitely talking about getters as well. Because when you have the private field, the private field seed, remember, we had it before, this is protection. And even in this case, it's not protection because you know we have reflection API, we can have, we can access this field anyhow. We can, technically it's possible. So if the programmer, if the user of the object is disciplined, if the user of the object respects the idea which the author of the object put there, then this person will respect it and will, uh, will not touch the seed field. But maybe it's not going to happen and maybe uh, the, 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 another guy who is using my object will just say like the like uh, in my in the comments in the comments you say right now reflection breaks integrity exactly reflection will break in integrity because uh, when I, when I design an object I say don't touch the seed don't touch my seed this is mine nobody can touch it so this is the integrity I protect my integrity I protect what's inside I want it to be encapsulated I don't Simply put, I don't want you to know what's in my house. That's it. You want to get some service from me? Pay me, I'll give it to you. But don't look into my house. Don't look inside. It's my business. That's what object-oriented is about, object-oriented programming. But then we introduce a getter. We just say public uh, int get seed. Boom, boom. So how... Where is encapsulation? Where is integrity now? It's gone. In this case, there is no more integrity at all. When we introduce a getter, we just allow everybody publicly, we announce, we encourage them to do this. We just say, go, look into what's inside of me, just get it. You, you are free to know what is the seed. You are okay. To know what's inside of me and and this is a language feature so it is possible to create this public integer getter and return the seed this is what David West is talking about so he's not talking about only programmers he's talking about in general software development it's a discipline not a real barrier so technically we have no languages no programming languages which would allow you to really protect your private at private fields in any programming language, you can just introduce a getter and boom, the whole integrity is gone. And how many disciplined programmers we have? How many programmers we have who respect object encapsulation? Not so many. We will look at the code in a few minutes in the, in the open source code and you will see how many times people use getters and how much they protect the integrity of their objects. They don't. They don't do that. And that's sad. That's not good. So we have, no, we have no technical instruments to protect the integrity. That's what uh, David, uh, Dr. Dr. West, uh, is, uh, is, is complaining about. That we have no technical means. We only rely on discipline. We rely on people to respect other objects. To respect the object and, and designers to be disciplined to somehow not give others the access to, uh, to their internals. But if the languages... Uh, the ID, uh, the community, everybody, the books, everybody introduce, read, read about object-oriented programming. I don't know, the second, the second page or the page number 10, you will meet getters. They will start telling you that this is the way to write code. Hey, do you introduce the private field? Okay, the next step is the getters and setters. Everybody telling you this. And languages don't have real barriers. Even though, look at this explicit barriers and then we say no real barrier so on one side they say encapsulation is an explicit barrier and then on another side they say no not really a barrier it doesn't put the border between the two objects 
you can still get and take my uh, you can still take my my attribute unless it's private but even if it's private it's still possible but okay let's imagine the language where private means private they don't exist but still imagine and then uh, well to my knowledge they don't exist and, uh, and, then, and then still people will introduce the getters and here somebody is asking the question so let me answer that uh, question um, the question is is it okay to mix behavior and for instance once one getter so and then the question continues i'm writing a library to interact with the telegram telegram bot api uh, and i have message object if i really need to analyze the text of incoming message can i let myself define get text or it's not okay well uh, uh, we will discuss it in a minute, like how to do, I mean, what to do with that. But in general, I would suggest that if you see the necessity to make the get out of your object, then stop there and start thinking why it happens, why you need your object to just give away the data and, uh, and, uh, and lose the control of the data. And now we move to the next slide. So let's see these two pieces of code. Look at it. I'm talking, I'm, I'm, I'm now interested to talk about integrity. So what is protecting integrity? Look at the left slide. Well, left, left snippet. The class is user. The user encapsulates the name, the name of the user. And here we get, we have a getter, the getter called get name. So I can get the name of the user. And then, uh, and then depending of, and then later, I use this class here, I say user get name, and I decide if employees, if this user is an employee, then I pay salary to the user. This is very traditional way of writing code. And look at the code on the right. I also encapsulate the name, and then I introduce a method is employee. So the decision whether this user is employee or not is made by the user, not outside, but inside. So this class much better protects the integrity than the class on the left. The class on the left has no integrity. It just tells everybody what's his name. It tells everybody who wants to know. He gives away the name. It means no integrity. So he has no personality. He has no personal semantic. He's completely anemic. He's not doing anything. He's not behaving anyhow. He's completely dumb. He's stupid, not stupid, dumb. <laughs> He's not thinking. He doesn't have any brains. Your name, that's my name. What happens later, I don't care. You check whether I'm employee, you check this. What you do with my name, I don't care. You just take it away and use it. The class on the right is much more uh, sophisticated, much, more, much smarter, much more um, self-contained. The integrity is higher. So he says, no, 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 I'm not going to give you my name. What do you need it for? You want to know if I'm an employee? Let me deal with my internal information. I'll think about it and I will tell you, yes, I'm an employee or not. So this decision will be made by me. I'm not allowing you to make this decision. Let me decide who I am. This is much more object-oriented design than the, than the class on the left. And then later we just check, okay, if user is employee, perfectly, then we continue. So the user on the right, encapsulates the same data than the user on the left but on top of this data the behavior is being added additional behavior so we increase the, the increase not increase extend the semantic of data because without this method is employee this is just plain data this is just data without semantic we just don't know it's some string some collection of bytes which is pretty uh, pretty useless without the semantic. So here the semantic, the, 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 the behavior is moved away from the object. So we kind of tear the object apart. So if you look at this one, this is pretty consistent object. The left one is like teared apart. So one part goes here, another part goes there. So we just take one object and spread it into two pieces. One piece goes into one place, becomes anemic. And another piece goes somewhere else, I don't know where, and it 
and it, it is actual behavior. So that's what integrity is about. So let me read your questions. If we introduce too much behavior in user object, won't in, will it become a God object? It's a very good question. So let's say we have this is employee method and then we have get me calculate my salary and then increase my salary and then uh, hire me and then fire me and then move me to another department and so on and so forth. So will be many, many, many methods of one object. In order to avoid this, we don't want that. We don't want to remember on the first lecture, I told you that a good object will contain maybe one, two, three methods, but not 10, not 20. If you have 10 methods in an object, then you're doing it, your design wrong, that's for sure. So you need one, two, three methods. In order to avoid this God object, then you, you, you decompose your uh, abstraction to smaller abstractions. For example, here the user is something large. And then instead of doing is employee, we're doing like this. User, uh, employment. is employee. So I first take something like employment abstraction from the user. So I come to the user and I say, hey, build for me another object which will abstract the employment status of a user. And then in this employment status, I will be able to ask, are you an employer? Please fire yourself or please hire yourself or move you to another department. And then there will be another something I will say, user, maybe uh, uh, salary. And then in salary, I can do, for example, raise the salary, I don't know, plus five. So salary is another abstraction, which I take away from the user. So that's the way I believe it should be. Uh, another question, there is so much functionality that depends on the information about user. Yeah, of course. It depends on on depends on the on what you deal with. So you always look at the abstraction at hand and decide how big is going to be your class. If there's a pretty small class and abstraction is pretty small, then one class is enough. Sometimes there will be I don't know 20, 50 classes, 50 different abstractions because the the world around us, the world that you are trying to um, model in your code, is pretty large and it will be large. So you need many objects. Many, not just one user and then many methods. You need many objects. A few more questions. Um, build or return the existing object. Employment might be a field in a user. No, it's definitely not a field. So employment is definitely an object which a user builds. A user creates an object employment or an object salary. It's not, it's not a field. We, we just don't let anybody to touch our fields, to get their fields, to... Uh, absolutely not. So we always use the word private if we can. In some languages we just cannot, for example in JavaScript. In JavaScript everything will be public, so... But if you can use private, then you definitely need to use it. Uh, another question, pretty good one. Uh, why not create object employee that decorates a user? Yes, we can do that. I'm just... We just didn't discuss decorators much yet, but this is another approach. Of course, you can create another object, which is uh, not necessarily a decorator, because decorator is when you uh, maintain the interface. So let's say you have a user, and then you create, a, I don't know, an underpaid user, or a unemployed user, or I don't know, retired user. So there's one user, and another user decorated, but it still is a user. In this case, employment is uh, something else. It's a different concept. So it's not really a decorator, but it could be an object that is a composition of user and something else. So you create employment. Inside, you, you, you encapsulate a user and some other information. And then for this object, so you basically will going to use it like this. You will say new employment, employment, and then here new user, I don't know, 42 like this. And then on this object you will do dot is, I don't know, employed. Something like this. So this is also another, another approach. And yes, there's a comment that it won't have access to the user fields. That's, that's a separate question. Yes, it will not have access to user fields. So in this case, the question is how they will interconnect. So how they will communicate. So how this object will communicate to this one. Uh, how, wh wh what's going to be the interface? what exactly they will, they will interchange, what kind of information. 
that's a separate separate discussion. So in this case, I mean this this is more difficult on the left. This one is more difficult. This usually is more uh, is easier to implement. Another question: If it's a field, is it okay to do such getter of employment? Uh, if employment is a field, then yes, you just get the field out of there. But then it's a field, so you don't need a getter. Just let just give the direct access to the field. And that's it. And now let me continue and show you one more slide on the on the, on the encapsulation topic. Uh, so this is the most important actually slide in this lecture. So look look close at this code. Here I will make you a summary. I will just try to show you exactly why uh, taking the data away and getting access to the data of objects is a is going to turn into a large problem. So look at the class on the left and the right. So we are talking about some box. And some box has a weight and the weight look at the left left piece of code it's in kilograms so we encapsulate uh, kilograms uh, and then we encapsulate into the field which is called weight and then the getter returns the weight and then we want to print the weight in pounds so what I do I take the W I use get weight so I retrieve the weight from the box then I understand okay there's in kilograms so I need to convert to pounds and then I finally print the weight in pounds very straightforward easy to understand look at the code on the right here we encapsulate in kilograms and I have a method get pounds I do the, the conversion inside the object and then people use it like this you take the pounds from there and I print the pounds so the code on the left, what's the problem? You probably understand that the, this code is bad and this code is good. What's the difference? The difference is that the left code, how does it know that I, I'm a developer of the box class? How does it know that I maintain, I have the weight of my box in kilograms? How did they make this assumption? They were, imagine there are two people writing this code. This is one person writing this, and there's another person writing this. It's number one, it's number two. So the, the developer number one made an implementation so that the weight is uh, contained inside. So the semantic of this data, of this integer, look, it's just an integer. It's not kilograms, it's not pounds, it's just integer. It's completely naked data. It's a data without any information what's in it. The only information, the only hint that we have is this, the text, weight. Okay, now I know that int is not a temperature, int is not an ID, it's probably a weight. So probably a weight in what? Probably in kilograms. So I am very lucky that I see kg here. So I'm just saying, oh, the developer number two. is saying, oh, probably he meant a kilograms. Most probably, because why kg? So I make a clever guess. And I make this assumption, so I implement it this way. So I take the weight, then I do the conversion, then I print it. What happens if tomorrow the developer number one comes into the code and says, ah, you know, I don't like storing this in kilograms. How about I store it in grams? You know, grams are better. Grams are better, so now the weight will be by 1,000 multiplied. Yeah, it's better for me how we will be able to find all the places in the code go through all of these cases all of these places and somehow fix them in order to move from kilograms to grams how many places there will be of course in this primitive example we can find it because there are just a few lines of code in the program but imagine a large program where we have a class which expose the field through getters with no additional semantic or very limited additional semantic because it's direct access to the raw data. So what happens when we change uh, the meaning of this data in the original class? How many bugs are we going to get? Invisible bugs because compile, the compiler will compile everything. The compiler will not understand that now we store grams instead of kilograms. My point is that here, at this method, the data 
have been escaped from the object. They left the object in a raw form, in a raw, in a, I call it in a naked way. So the data is naked, no dress, no information about it. It's just integer. And luckily, we know it's a weight. Okay, yes, but that's, that's too little. This information is quite limited. Even in this case, even in this case, it's not good, it's okay code. It's not really good. It also goes out. Also, the information goes out. Also, the data jumps out. Because again, pounds, okay, pounds is okay because it's more, more, you know, more fixed. So we cannot move from, but still, maybe it's gross, the weight. Or maybe it's net. We don't know. This information is not there. So it's much better to take this code and move it into the class and let the class print the weight. Let the class encapsulate this printing functionality. Don't get the data jump out of the class because the moment the data goes out, it goes, we don't know where. We just lose control. Who use our data? How they use our data? What they know about our data? How much assumptions they made about our data? How much did they assume? Maybe they assume too much. Maybe they make wrong assumptions. We cannot control that. I don't know what they do because there are other people. We don't want that. We want to say, hey, there's encapsulation. So I know what to do with my data. Only I know, you don't know. I don't want you to, to make these decisions. You want this data to be printed? Okay, make, the, the, make me, let me print the data. I will print it. You want this data to be stored in the database? I will do it for you. But I will not give you the data in a raw format. I'm not returning you the integer. I'm not going to return you the float. I'm not going to return you the string. If I believe that this string or integer, they belong to me, they belong to my, uh, to my functionality. They are my state. That's the bottom line of, uh, uh, of, the, of the idea of, of getters, of encapsulation. So encapsulation means data don't escape objects in raw, in naked format. Only the special data. For example, here, like in the previous example, we also may say that the data jumps out. For example, Boolean. You see, the Boolean is also data. They also go away. But this is not my data. I don't store Boolean. I don't rely on this data. This is just a temporary piece of data, just Boolean, which is represent whether I'm employee or not, whatever. I can give you this data. Use it whatever you want. What can you do with it? What kind of assumption you can make with it? Not so much. It's Boolean, which means true or false, and you definitely know where you get it. The name is is employee, so you can easily understand, everybody will understand what it means. Nobody will make wrong assumptions. But here, imagine how many wrong assumptions they can make if I let them do get weight. Let me check your questions, because you ask too much, I'm not so fast. Uh, the question is why box itself should be responsible for converting the value. Just like I explained to you, because the box is very protecting its data. It wants to protect the data. It wants the integrity. It doesn't want you or me or anybody else to know what to do with the weight. It doesn't want to. Because we expect you to make a mistake. If I give you the weight, you most probably will make a mistake. You don't know it's a gross or net. You don't know if it's pounds or kilograms. You don't know many things about the weight. And I don't want you to know because I don't want to chase you later and ask you, hey, please change something because I changed the, the, uh, my implementation. I changed the, uh, the meaning of this data. I don't want to look, I don't want to go around the code, all application and see, okay, who got my data? And, and imagine that this W may go somewhere else, may go to another class, may be assigned to another variable and may be stored to the database and may be sent over the network. So it may be used in many places across the application. And then imagine in the main place where it's generated, I change the meaning of this, double, of this W. Boom, it's a total collapse. And this is just a primitive example. In real examples, we have bigger problems with that. Another question, is it like storing piece of the product in all the existing currencies? 
Uh, how you deal with the internals of the box, for example, how you store, what you store there, it's up to the box. Sometimes it will lead to uh, it will lead to inefficiencies inside the implementation of the of the class. And this is very uh, famous question which I hear. So people say this is more it is more uh, uh, effective sometimes to just give the data away and let that users deal with the data instead of encapsulating everything in the box. Yes, sometimes it will look the longer the code may look longer if you put many things into the box. If you make the box too smart about its own data, but that's okay. This problem is smaller than the problem of data being escaped and being moved uh, to unknown places in the application. Next question. If we introduce get kilogram to box, would it be okay? There will be no behavior, but it seems logical, isn't it? Yes, it's a, it's, of course it's a, it's a sum solution. Of course, instead of get weight, you can say get kilograms. But again, what about gross and net? You're gonna have says you're gonna you have to say get kilograms, get gross kilograms. So you need to make more, you need to make the length of your method larger. You need to probably write some documentation for your method. So you're trying to solve, you're trying to introduce a, a workaround. You just know that people will make a mistake. So you're just saying, okay, how to prevent people from making mistakes? Let's give them documentation for the method. Let's make the name of the method long. This is what most Java, uh, Java frameworks are doing. They introduce large method names. And there are many jokes about the Spring framework, for example. They have a large method names because in this method name, they need to explain everything, what's going on. Because they just, the data or something, the object just jumps away. Uh, and then they, they explain what it is because not letting you make a mistake. Well, Maybe it's not directly exactly their problem, but it's somehow connected. So long method names, it's an indicator of bad design. Long variable names is an indicator of bad design. I, I wrote some times ago some uh, blog post about it, that compound method names and compound variable names, in my opinion, it's an indicator of bad design. So if you need to say, uh, you need to say for example, uh, kilogram weight, if you use this name, so this is compound name, so this is one part, this is another part. And if you need to concatenate words in order to build a larger name, it's a problem with the design. So stop right there, don't do it. Make it weight or make it kilograms. Make it always your, always your field, your attribute must be one single noun, as well as the variable inside your method. One single noun without any extensions, without any concatenation of, uh, of, the, of other nouns. And the same preferably for the method, for the name of the method. It should be a noun or it should be a verb. But still, a verb or a noun, but not two verbs, not noun plus verb. Well, there are some exceptions, for example, is employee. That could be, that could be a, a, an exception because in Java you cannot put a question mark. But the good name method would be employee question mark. That would be a perfect method name. I'm just asking, are you employee? But in Java, you don't have it, so you use is employee. That's okay. That's just one single exception for Boolean methods, for the methods returning Boolean. But in all other cases, just one single word. Uh, with your approach, is it possible to have class with three, five methods? Yeah, I told you, three, five, okay, five maybe is too much for me. But still, it's doable. I have, I have classes with five methods. I have classes with maybe ten methods, but it's always... It's, it's the, the, the more methods, the, the, the worse the design. It's just an indicator for you. The more methods you have, uh, the, the further you go down the road of making bad design. Another question. So far, I understand that all the functionality should be in the class making like a God object. Uh, no, not really. You, like I told you, not really. You don't need to make your, your object, uh, you know, grow too big because you need to decompose into, into smaller objects and then let your big object return those objects if it's necessary. So definitely not God object. Like I told you, three, five methods and that's it. If you, if you make more, then stop and think uh, what's going on and why you need to, to have so many. There's another comment. You say, you propose ideas which contradict each other. Is it okay? That's a comment. Is it okay that class is long, but it's not okay that class have lots of methods? 
uh, it's okay that class is long, but it's not okay that class... Well, you're right. You're right. Definitely good catch. So I'm saying on one side that uh, first, well, there, we need to solve problems one by one. So the problem number one is getters. So get rid of getters. When you get rid of getters, you will move a lot of functionality into your class. So your class will become larger. Done. It's first problem. We solve that problem. It's step number one. Now you look at the class. There are many, many methods. Now you solve this problem. How you do this? You extract abstractions away. So you, like we did with the employment, like we did with the salary. So you see the class user, it grows. Now it's big. Maybe it has 15 methods. Now you say, okay, these five methods, we can extract and call it abstraction employment. So we take it away. Now we have just one method and another class with five methods. And then we extract another abstraction. Then we extract another abstraction. And then finally, step number two is complete. And you have uh, pretty concise and pretty solid classes. I hope I answered your question. Uh, another one. Could you please answer my questions about message object and the start of chat history? Now, let me scroll it up. Try to find your questions about message object. A message. I remember you asked about this message uh, and the get text. I think we discussed that. So get text uh, is okay. Uh, I mean, it's not okay <laughs> to have get text. Anyhow, having getters is not good. So my answer is uh, try to do something else. And I will show you what. So now we're getting to the, to the chapter where we discuss what to do instead. Uh, we don't have too much time. So basically now chapter number three. What is the solution? So how do we uh, solve that? Uh, the number one idea, which we already discussed, sort of, is uh, it's formally called tell, don't ask. Maybe you've heard about that. Tell, don't ask. It means that tell me what to do. Don't ask me to give you my internals. That's encapsulation. So come to me and tell me what to do. This is an example. We, we remember this book, this book DTO. So we had this uh, before. We had this, some getters here. Get, 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 whatever. So we get rid of them. And now we have one method print. So we just now, this is not a DTO anymore. So now we tell the book what to do. We tell print yourself. And the book will print. And look at the code. We take the book from the, again, it's not DTO. So we take the book from wherever it, we can take it. And then we say DTO, hey, print yourself. And it just prints yourself, prints itself. Simple as that. Tell, don't ask. This is a very simple example. Again, you will not be always do that. It's not so easy sometimes. Sometimes you may have problems of how to organize it, but just if you force yourself not to use getters, you will eventually start thinking in this direction. So you will think, why am I giving away my data? Why am I giving this to them and they use it? Why can't I just do what they want me to do? Because what this book is coming from, for what? So we are asking some external service. Give me the book. Okay, the book is here. Then why did we ask for the book? What was the purpose? The purpose was to print it on the screen, to show it to the user. So let's teach the book. Let's make the book smarter. And then the book will print itself. Then you will start, your, your objects <laughs> will become larger, definitely. They will become more fat. Let's put it this way. Because traditionally, in traditional programming, objects are very skinny. They're very thin because they're DTOs. They have no functionality. They're anemic. They have no features inside. They just store the data. And then we have procedures around in the code which use these objects. Procedure, procedure, procedure. Many utility classes or controllers, as they call in, in web applications. So there are many, many controllers. Each controller is just taking the thin object with no meat, with no behavior. Just tear the object apart, take all the data from there, and just do a large algorithm of how this object, how this data will be uh, managed and then used there and there. That's what you have now in most applications. But I'm suggesting to you, hey, make this controller smaller. 
make them know a little bit less about your objects, a little bit less, a little bit less, and move this functionality into the objects, and the objects will become a little bit larger, a little bit larger, and eventually, eventually, your objects will be huge, and you will have the zero controllers. In the next few lectures, I will show you some of my code where I have this. We have no controllers. We have no places where we have like a procedure, the algorithm, which is dealing with the object. We just have large objects, very fat, very smart, with many uh, features inside. So that's the principle. Tell, don't ask. I did not invent this. This is not my name. It was invented long before I started uh, thinking about all this. It's called tell, don't ask. Google it. Uh, that's one approach. Move functionality into objects. Another approach is just suggesting to you get rid of the if you. That's, that's a workaround. I mean, understand it. This is a workaround. This is not good. Not good. But it's okay. It's okay if you don't know what to do. If you still want to give away your data, at least don't give your getters a name get author, get title, get ID. Call them like this, ID, author, title. In this case, you really kind of, you know, uh, uh, you're really going down the road where potentially you can change the implementation inside. So you're telling your users, you know, it's not really a getter. So I'm not really giving you the internals of me. I'm just, maybe temporary, I am. Maybe temporary, it's implemented like a getter here, look. This implementation is definitely the getter implementation. But the user who will come to this, the user will just look at it and say, eh, yeah, that's not, okay, this is a mistake. It's not a DTO. They probably do some, a lot of features inside and then they decided somehow for some reason to give me the title, to give me the author. All right, I respect that. So I take it, but I understand that there is a functionality inside. So this is behavior because in this case, it looks like a behavior. It doesn't look like a dumb getters from a, from a dumb DTO. That's a comment. Uh, agree, maybe in the future field will disappear and will be calculated in runtime, not by returning a field. Exactly, that's my point. So when you give a name like this, you're kind of telling everybody that this is really some functionality was there. So there's behavior. So for example, for calculating, let's put it this way. For example, it's a book and then I say integer, I don't know, price. Price and this price is calculated somehow internally. Uh, you know, it's not it's not stored there. So we only know ID, author, and title. And price is calculated. I don't know somehow maybe if the author is this, then the price is 19.99. And if the author is this, then the price is 9.99. So there is some functionality inside the calculation of the price by giving by making the name sound like price. You are giving a good hint. To the developer that they can kind of uh, treat you like a like a normal object like an object with behavior not like a dumb DTO so they don't abuse you so that's the second my, my second suggestion to you it will look when I see the code like this I kind of understand this is this is okay I can tolerate that I can say well no getters at least no getters because getters is like a immediate indicator that people are programming C instead of object-oriented. And of course, step number three, also possible. And I think we are close to, to finishing this. So uh, uh, make, make your fields public. That's also a solution. Instead of getters. Because getters, like I said, they're completely them is leading you. They're telling you that you're kind of, that you are having actually encapsulation, that you're encapsulating something, but you're not encapsulating anything. You're just misleading everybody and yourself. You, you, you start thinking that you are actually protecting something, but you're not. Just make your, um, your fields, oh, this is wrong, this should be public. So make your fields public, 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 and then just use them like this. That's also okay. This is, this is better than getters, in my opinion. This is better than getters because you're not fooling anybody. You're not cheating. You're just saying, hey, this is just my, I am the dumb DTO. I am the, the completely anemic, stupid uh, record of data. I'm not an object. I'm not lying to you. I'm not an object. I'm not pretending that I have a behavior. I don't. I don't have any behavior. All I have is a state and zero behavior. 
So use me like a container of data. Don't even expect me to think. Then okay. Then it's okay. Then on the, on the level of a client, I will understand, okay, this object was designed by some designer who is not even, in, who is not even trying to do object-oriented programming for some reason. Maybe, I don't know, for some, for some reason. Maybe the programmer believes that this is not the right place for object-oriented programming. So it's okay. Okay. All right, then, yeah, something to read and watch. You can see it on the slides. I recommended one blog post of me, but mostly you need to read these three pay, these three articles, which basically will uh, explain you more or less the same I told you, maybe in, in better words uh, and, and more uh, with more focus on, um, you know, on, the, on, on, the, on the main point. Uh, Okay, I'm reading your questions. Will it be okay if there are quite a lot of fields in the class as we cannot store the data inside the methods? Well, about the fields, I can say the same as about the methods. So if your class has more, in my opinion, more than three fields, then most probably you're doing something wrong. Of course, if you have 10 fields, then that's total garbage. Something is absolutely wrong. Three, maybe four, maybe five. These numbers are okay, but in, I'm trying three. Every time I see my class has more than three, I'm questioning myself, can I do something different? Because three is already the, the borderline. Four is too much. Let me share my screen and we will look at the Spring Framework code. Just for fun. Again, we'll try to, uh, to criticize what they write. It's a huge uh, code base, Spring Framework in Java, and it's full of getters everywhere. These getters are everywhere. Uh, it's, it's terrible. In my opinion, Spring Framework is one of the most terrible uh, Java applications, which are the most popular and one of the most useful. So look at the code they write. So it's just, you know, I, I was trying to find you something specifically to show, but uh, like, look, they, first of all, they use this get prefix in a completely misleading way. So look, private, string, pri private static int get port. So you expect this get port to get port from the class, right? But this class is, it doesn't have any fields. So after thinking a little bit, you realize, ah, this get port is actually getting port from here. And then why port is here? I have no idea. So probably there's a default port. And so maybe <laughs> should we calculate port off? This is how I would call this method, but not get port. So they completely, the author of this class completely misunderstand what is a getter. Even though we know good getters are bad, so they, they don't understand. Let's take a look at something else. It's any class. I'm just clicking the class and uh, methods, so fields, 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 set, get, get, get. Many of these you see, this is the getter, which is actually a generator. So here, get allowed origin patterns. At the same time, we have the field allowed origin patterns. But look what's happening. Instead of just returning to us this, this pattern, if it's null, it returns us null. But if it's not null, it just uses it. It passes through the stream and then, oops, and then makes a list out of it. So probably this guy is not a list, or it is, or it is a list. So it does some, it does some processing of the, of the data, and then returns to us. So again, that's kind of misleading for me. That would be as if I'm a user. That would be kind of weird because I expect getter to make me the access to what's inside, but not after it is modified because look they set it and then I set it so I expect to get what I set but after I set <laughs> what's coming back to the get through the getter is going to be something else again let's click something else I'm just clicking randomly completely I don't know what I'm clicking just whatever get return value handler 
if, if, return. Otherwise, return null. About null, we will talk about uh, probably a few lectures down the road. So this is a completely, in my opinion, wrong idea to return null. A terrible idea, returning null. So when you get a getter, when you try to get a getter, then in my opinion, you need to throw an exception here, but not return null. But they do it. You see, they return null. Again, they, they, they check something and then they return. But my point is that getters are everywhere. Container. This is container. Again, some fields. Set, set, get, get, set, get, set, get, set. The entire model <laughs> of Spring Framework is about these uh, anemic objects, which which even sometimes they are maybe not anemic, but then the names are misleading. For example, here, get model. If you use default model, then re return default model. Else, redirect, return to this. So in this particular case, get model will return you three different models. Either the default one, or the empty one, or the real one, or the re re or redirect one, which, which stays inside. Why wouldn't call it model? That would be more logical to me. Just model. I'm not getting the model. I'm building a model. I'm building a model, making some internal decisions inside. It's not a getter. It's a, it's a calculator of a model. It, it, it is model. Use default model. Okay, it's kind of a setter. Get default model. This is a setter. This is a clear setter. A clear getter, sorry. Get default model, which is clearly diff But see the difference between these two methods. This is get, uh, get model, and this is get default model. So this one is doing what I expect it to do. This one is doing a completely different thing. It's actually behavior. So it shouldn't be called uh, get model. It should be called model. Set, set, set status, set status, get status. Set is, set binding, it, and so on and so forth. Setters, setters, setters. In my opinion, it's super boring to write code like this and super unmaintainable. And it's everywhere. Any class I click, any, it's always you're going to get setters and getters. Always everywhere so let me finish so don't write code like this <laughs> if you want your code to be uh, maintainable <laughs> the question is can you show us a good code it will really help us in developing our projects yes uh, i will show you good code most probably next lecture i will show you some of my code which i believe in my opinion is good but uh, yeah for example takes framework is one of the uh, code, code bases, which not only me, there are many developers there, so we all together created this takes framework. Uh, you can take a look at it, I can give you the link, but you can just Google takes framework. It's in Java, and it is written, in my opinion, like a m much more object-oriented than, for example, Spring framework. And it's quite stable, it has about 700 stars, of course not as many stars as Spring, but still I think it's it is in the community, so you can look at it and see how it's designed.